All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today I just want to quickly recap what we talked about related to fixed and random effects first. Uh, and then we're going to finish this lecture here. We're going to run another exercise where we're going to treat block as random. So just as a reminder, in, in a completely randomized design, we only have one source of error or, or random error, and that's our residual of the model. Uh, in a randomized complete block design, we have the block effect. The block effect, if treated as fixed, we still only have one residual error, random error in that model. If we treat block as random, we have two sources of random variability in that model because one of them is coming from blocks being treated as random. So we did run already an exercise on RCBD treating the block as fixed. We're going to run another example treating it as random and trying to understand what are the differences, what are the implications, and so on. So before we get to that exercise, let's quickly recap here what we talked about last class. So the topic of this lecture was fixed versus random effects. Um, and just, I guess this picture here actually perhaps may help you to understand a little bit of this. So imagine that we have different blocks. Imagine that each distribution here is a different block, but I do not care for the mean yield, for example, whatever is your response variable. Let's think about yield. I do not care what is my yield mean for block one or block two or block three. That is not of my interest. I do not care for those means. I want to know the mean of my treatments. The block is just in my model to help me to control for heterogeneity in an experimental material. So if I do not care for the means, but I do want to still consider that variability coming from blocks and account for it, I can treat blocks as random. So imagine that in this example here on the left, imagine that each one of these distributions is the yield distribution for different blocks. I do, really do not care for the mean of those distributions. I just want to know about the variability of those blocks and incorporate that into my analysis, into that random component related to the random effect of block. That's when we would treat block as random. And if I'm treating something as fixed, I still have that distribution, but I am interested in the mean of that distribution. It's important also that variability around it, so that still is considering the model, but explicitly I'm asking for the mean of those distributions. And this normally, this is why normally your treatment effects, your treatment factors are fixed because we want to know the mean of those treatment effects on your response variable. Normally, at least for us most of the time. All right, so uh, I'm just going to browse quickly through what we've been through already. A fixed effect is basically an effect that we choose specific levels, like the fertilizer rates that we have already chosen. Uh, we can recreate that, and we're interested in the mean response of those treatments on your response variable. So I want to know what's the effect of applying 0, 100, and 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare on yield. I want the mean of that. And then if you have a model that only has fixed effects, so every model has at least one random effect, that's the residual. So if everything else except for the residual is fixed, then that model is called a fixed effect model, which only, again, only has one source of variability or error, that's the residual error. And we just, a quick example here would be a model with an overall mean, the effect of nitrogen rate, and then a residual that EIJ is our only random component of this model that every model has at least one. So if you only have that residual as a random error in this model, it is a fixed effect model. And then something that perhaps I didn't stress out and stress enough is the assumptions that we check for the linear model are all based on this little sentence here, right? So this is what is telling us that it should be independently, identically uh, distributed normal with a mean of zero and sigma square of E. That's the assumption of the error component, right? So every time that we add a new random component, we have the same assumption applied to that new part as well. So we have to check for that when we do have random or mixed effect models. Anyways, in the case of the fixed effect model, we just have one source of error uh, or random error in this model. That's the EIJ. That's the residual error. A random effect is something that we are really interested in the variability of that and not necessarily on the mean of that effect on our response variable. 
right? So again, if I want, let's say if I want to create a matching rate recommendation for corn or cotton for the whole state of Georgia, I would perhaps ideally use sites that were a random population of potential agricultural sites in the state. I would run the same study, let's, let's say multiple nitrogen rates. And then in my model site would be a random effect because I really don't care about if, how was the response in Watkinsville or Midville or Tifton. I really want to use those locations to understand the variability of the population of sites in Georgia so I can make an overall statewide recommendation. So that's when we would treat something as random. And really, again, we're interested in the variance or variability of that rather than the mean of that. And really, in our case, in agriculture, some very common examples of random effects would be ears, sites, and also blocks. And blocks, perhaps most, at least what I've, perhaps is a little bit different in your specific um, areas, but what I've seen in the literature I read and the, the, my team, places I've been, most people that run field trials especially run in randomized complete block designs. That's one of the most common experimental designs out in the field. Um, and so there's always this question of, should I treat blocks as fixed or as random? And that's what we're gonna talk more about in today's class. If you have a model that only has random effects, so there is no fixed effect in that model. So let's say I, I collect all this data well, let's say that I just go to a whole bunch of fields and I pull samples without really a treatment in place. I just want to pull a lot of samples for yield across multiple sites in Georgia. So I have some idea of the variability of corn yield in Georgia. I would treat that model, it would basically just have site in that model and that site factor could be random because I do not care again by the, for the mean of the sites. I just care about the variability coming from that um, group of sites that I used. So if a model only has random effects in this case, then it would still have more than one source of variation because there is one source of variation coming from the random effect and there is one in every model coming from the residual. So we have more than one there. And if you only include random effects, uh, that is a random effect model, right? In R, we, one of the packages and functions we can use to run that is the function LMER from the package LME4. It's a very popular function as well. So in this case here, we have our overall mean. Uh, we have our alpha i is the random effect of a given nitrogen rate. Uh, and then we have the residual. So in this case here, we have two sources of error. One is the variability for the nitrogen rates in this case with, with alpha i, and then the variability of the error, which again, every model has. This error, models that have random effects do have extra errors that we need to check the assumptions for. And then if we're using a random effect model, as we just said, any observation that you pull, that variability around that observation can be explained by two sources of variation. One of them is at the level of the factor that you included as random in the previous example that was nitrogen rate, and then the variability associated with the residual error, which uh, comes from that residual component of the model. So sigma square A in this case would be the group variance attributed to variability between nitrogen rates in that example. And sigma square E is that residual variance that's attributed to variability within nitrogen rates. I think this is where we stopped and I just wanna perhaps tell you a little bit more about this. So there are three methods to estimate variance components. What happens is variance components, especially the more complex of a model you have, and the more random effects and, and fixed effects you have in the model, the more complex it becomes to properly estimate the variance components that we're talking about. So the three methods that are listed here, the first one is the ANOVA type three sum squares or methods of moments that is based on the mean squares uh, formula that we've seen up until now, but it can yield negative estimates of variance, which is not, is not biologically possible, right? So it can, So if that's the case, then people just set it, set it to zero, but it's not advised. Um, or when, it, when it, this happens, this method here is not advised. The other method is maximal likelihood that its drawback is that it may underestimate the variance components, so it is biased. And then we have the restricted maximal likelihood, which is what we should be using uh, when we're feeding these models that produces unbiased estimates of variance. It is the preferred method especially if you have unbalanced data. So if you do have unbalanced data, 
um, this method here is going to be the best to account for that and still produce the proper standard errors of your means and comparisons, which, you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we may not fully realize this, but by properly identifying a model, we are making sure that we are estimating the errors associated with the means and with the pairwise comparisons properly. And by specifying the wrong model, we are estimating the wrong errors. And by estimating the wrong errors, we are impacting the ANOVA p-values, we're impacting the pairwise comparison p-values, we're impacting everything that we would use for making inference in a model. So really specifying the correct model's error structure is really important um, in any case, especially in design studies. Okay, so sometimes this question here may be very straightforward. So let's say, again, we go back to that example. If I just wanted to know the overall nitrogen response in Georgia, um, you know, I could select maybe 10 sites randomly selected from the state to go there, have nitrogen trials with corn, let's say, and have like three or four nitrogen rates. And then in the end, make this claim that in Georgia, the optimum rate was X. So the nitrogen rate optimized yield was a given rate that I saw as the overall most important across the states. However, in some cases, it's not very straightforward to decide if your, if your factors should be fixed or random. In the case of blocks, I think that's the most common one that it's not very straightforward. Some people do one way, other people do the another way. And uh, I just want to talk about that and provide you some examples. Okay, so if you're thinking about your own research, these are the questions that I would propose that you go through. So are you interested in specific levels of effectors? So I want to choose what, what, which varieties I'm using, which nitrogen rates I'm using, which pesticide rates I'm using, whatever it is. If you are interested in very specific levels of effector, you probably need a fixed effect term in your model. And again, most of the time, our treatment factors, so the ones coming from a treatment design that answer your objectives, would be fixed for the most part. Now, if you're interested in using levels as a sample of levels from a larger population, so let's say I have this population of nitrogen rates that can go from zero to, let's say, 400 pounds of end per acre, and I just want to want a sample from that population. It could be any three levels within that population. <clears throat> with the goal of assessing the variability of the larger population and not specifically the means of the levels that you're choosing. So if this, if you answer yes to this, so you're interested in just assessing the overall variability of that population. And if your levels were randomly selected from a population of potential levels. So again, this case, if you're ahead of population on nitrogen rates, I randomly select the levels from that population instead of picking which levels I want. So if you're interested in that variability, if you randomly select from the population and you have sufficient number of levels, what do I mean by this? So what happens here is a lot of times we, if we have the choice, I guess, of treating something random as random or as fixed, we should be thinking, do I have enough levels within that factor to properly estimate variance components? What I mean, what I mean by that is, for us to estimate a mean, we need a lot fewer data points than to reliably estimate a variance component. So imagine you have a population. Let me actually use my screen. It's going to be easier. <clears throat> so let me just uh, pull up the website here to show you an example of what I mean by that. So imagine that you have this population here of a given treatment factor. So let's say nitrogen rate. And I want to estimate the random effect of nitrogen rate on my response variable. If I pick, let's say, two random, two random levels here, this is really not enough for me to have a good estimate of the variability of this whole population based on the, just two levels, right? It may be enough for me to get the proper means of those levels if I'm treating them as fixed. But if I'm treating them as random, too few levels is not a good 
approximation to the variability of the whole population, which I'm assuming the whole population is, is the, the bell curve here and the two ticks here are the levels I'm selecting at random, right? So I guess you can imagine how if you just select two levels here, they may not represent the variability of this population here. So the more levels you randomly pick from this distribution, the more certain you are that you're actually representing the actual true variability of that population, which is the goal of treating something as random. So going back to our, our questions here is, if you do have a sufficient number of levels, some people say more than five, I've seen a threshold of more than 10, more than 12, and really, well, I guess before I say that, let me just finish this thought. So if you are interested in the variability instead of the mean of the levels of that population, if you did choose those levels randomly from a, from a larger population of levels and you have sufficient number of levels, so you selected enough levels from that larger population, then you may treat this as random. What happens is let's say you are interested in using in, in, in the variability, you did select them randomly, but you have fewer levels here, it may actually hurt you to treat this as random than treating as fixed because your estimates of variance for let's say two or three levels are going to be very poor estimates of that variance. Okay, let's see what comes after here. Okay, so I guess here I'm basically just telling you that, right? So for us to reliably estimate various components, we need more data, we need more levels than we need to estimate means. If we have fewer than that threshold of levels, so let's say I have only three nitrogen rates, should I really treat this as random, even if I'm interested in the larger population variability, and even if I chose those levels at random, probably not, because your various estimates is, are not gonna be accurate and you're gonna be better off treating them as fixed. A good example here that I just want to walk us through is a randomized complete block design. So if we just go back here to our questions, right? I am interested in specific levels of that factor. So if you think of levels of, of blocks would be one, two, three, four. Am I interested in those levels? Am I interested in the mean yield for each one of the blocks? Really, I'm not, right? I really don't care for that. The block is in my model, so it sucks up that extra variability coming from the from the blocks, but I'm really not interested in the means themselves. So I, perhaps I could treat this as random, right? So am I interested in using those levels as samples from a larger population and just assess the variability? I guess I could say yes here for blocks. We're really interested in just accounting for that variability coming from blocks. So that's what we're interested in. Were your levels randomly selected from a population of potential levels? What do you think? So if you if if you have field studies or greenhouse studies, do we normally so thinking of the field study setup, do we have like, okay, in this farm here, I have these hundred potential blocks in this farm. I'm going to randomly sample four. Doesn't work like that normally, right? Normally you go to a part of your field and you set up your blocks side by side in a way that maybe they represent a larger population, but you're not really sampling at random, right? They're, they're specifically chosen to be confined within an area most, most of the time. So they're really not a sample from a larger population of blocks. And normally, at least the studies that we run that I see most of the time, we have between three and four blocks. So we do not have more than five or eight levels here. I do not have more than five or eight blocks in my studies. So what to do then? Because I do, I do not care for the means, but at the same time, I do not check the boxes here of treating my blocks as random. And again, people do both ways. You're gonna see in the literature, if people explain their model and how they're treating their, their factors, they, some people may say I treat a block as random. Some people may say I treat a block as fixed. Is there a correct way? Let's talk about that. Um, or maybe let's see that more in action in our, in our exercise. All right, so we talked about fixed effects. If a model only has fixed effects, then it is a fixed effect model. We talked about random effects. If a model only has random effects, then it is a random effect model. And then we have mixed effect models that basically have both fixed and random effects together in the same model. So let's say if we do decide to run our RCBD with blocks as random, we have our treatment factors as fixed, 
our block is random, that makes our model a mixed effect model, right? Because they have, so they have both random and fixed, and because they have the random side of it, they do have more than one source of variation. So we're gonna have the residual error, but also the variance related to our random effects. Again, can be analyzed with the LMER function. And this here would be an example where I just want to walk you through what this formula here is. So YIJ would be, let's say, your yield observation on the jth block from the ith nitrogen rate. The mu here is the overall mean. The PJ is the, or the rho J is the random effect of the kth block. So if I do treat block as random, now this, I'm not, I'm not estimating the means of the blocks. I'm estimating the variance of the blocks. Alpha I is still our differential effect of nitrogen rate. So it is a fixed effect. And then we have our error uh, that we always have in, in every, every model. So in this case here, in this mixed model that I just showed you, we had two sources of error. So we have the error associated with the, rent, with the variance component coming from the block and also the error associated with the variance component coming from the, the true error of that model, which we always have the EIJ component. And then be, similarly to the random effects model in the mixed effect models, we also have the variance of a given observation, which is sigma square y being explained by the sum of these two sources of variability. So if you treat blocks as random, your observation is gonna have some variability that are, that's attributed to the block and some variability attributed to the error or the residual of that model. So just bringing our motivation example here again, where we have a two-way factorial with three nitrogen rates, three potassium rates for a total of nine trimming combinations. Um, previously, on the previous coding exercise that we just finished, I believe, last class, we treated blocks as fixed. So that was a fixed effect randomized complete block design model where our nitrogen rate, potassium rate, the interaction in blocks were all treated as fixed, right? Now, the next exercise is I want to, I want us to explore if we treat blocks as random. First, how do we do that? What do we need to change in the code for make that, that change? And also what is the implication of that in our analysis? So next, we're gonna actually run this exercise here where blocks are gonna be random and then nitrogen and potassium are still gonna be fixed. So we're gonna have a mix of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say that you will uh, focus only on variances and not focus on the mean, but it doesn't mean that where variances don't depend on the overall mean, right? Because variance is actually deviation from the mean of the whole population, right? Yeah, it's more like, th that. that is correct, but it's more related to the fact of what are we actually estimating from those, from that from that factor in the model, in this case, block, right? So <clears throat> if you treat as fixed, the model is gonna give you a mean for the block, right? So you can actually extract means for the blocks. If you treat block as random, the model is estimating a variance component, not a mean. So that variance component actually comes into play in defining the proper standard error of the means and of pairwise comparisons, right? So they are related, but it's just what the model is estimating and giving you as part of that model, right? So if, if we treat as random, it is not gonna give you a block mean. Even if you ask EM means to give you a block mean, it's not gonna work. It's gonna say, I don't have this term in my model because block is not anymore as part of the fixed effect part of the model, as part of the random effect, which then gives you a variance component. We can, ex we can extract the variance component if we wish and compare them, but normally we're not really interested much in that. Well, at least not in, in the way that I use. Perhaps in your case, if you're like, so if you're in plant breeding, you may be, actually, the variance component may be very important to you, right? You may really want to look into, you know, if you treat your genotypes or your sites and years as random, you may be actually interested in what is that variability from that population or from that sample of a population. Did that answer your question or just made it more confusing? <laughs> All right. Okay, so I added a, re a paper for you to read. Uh, I just added today, so this is, was not in the lecture last time. Um, I'm. I want to ask you to read when you have a chance. This may be in an upcoming quiz. Um, 
but I just want you to be familiar with this because I think this is going to, especially, you know, so when I, so the goal again of this class here was not for us to really go super deep into these details. It was more to give you to the surface level and give an applied example. But for that to happen and you still be able to understand, it requires for you to have that background, which I guess it was my intention that you already had the background. But if you don't have, which doesn't seem like you all had at least related to this, we are going a little bit deeper. And so I do want you to spend some time reading this paper. It is in our website. So if you go to our website, it's going to be the reading material for the February 13th class. It is a PDF if you just open that. Oh, page not found. Uh, okay, I know what will happen. Um, I'm going to fix that. <clears throat> and so we can have access to this paper here. So the, the link is broken because I have a white space in the name of the file. But I will fix that after class today so we have access to this reading material. It's just a paper where... It's a statistician uh, from Iowa State comparing treating blocks as fixed or random. What are the implications? And so I, I do want you to go through that to get a little bit more background on what we're talking about. Okay, so this wraps up this lecture here. The next thing that I want to do today is to actually go through that exercise of treating blocks as random. I think it was before the previous class period that I push to GitHub a script that is called, let's see, let me pull up my, my R studio here. Yeah, RCBD mix partial, that's what, that's what, um, that was the script. So if you already have done a git pull, um, and then copied and pasted this script into the code folder of the 04 RCBD project, then you're good to go. If you have not, I'm just going to give you a quick moment here. So the script is named 0215 RCBD mixed partial. That's the one that I want you to do a git pull and then copy from the GitHub repo folder into the 04 RCBD project under the code folder. Well, I'll give you this quick this quick uh, minute here to do that if you have not done yet. Uh, for those of you that are ready, please go ahead and launch your 04 CBD R proj. Make sure to always launch the project and not just double click on the script. And then launch that code that you just, that we're gonna work with. All right, I'm going to start moving here. If you need more time, let me know. So once Wait, you, can I, yep. Can I have just another uh, minute here, Dr. Bestos? I'm still, I'm having an issue. I'm just one second. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. When I pull up the 2024 DSA and I go to get a, do a git pull, uh, it says another git process seems to be running in this repository. An editor opened by git commit. Please make sure all processes are terminated. 
and then try again if this fails and get processed may have crashed this repository earlier. What do I need to do for that? Um, let's see. So if you go on your console, do you see a terminal window? Yes, sir. So if you click on that, does it, I mean, does it, it does it seem like there's something going on there, like running? I mean, just my normal uh OneDrive pulled up. Okay. So I'm not sure why that's going on. And maybe, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think we would have to spend a little bit more time to troubleshoot it. So I'll close it out and try it again, but uh, I guess you can keep going. I'll catch up. Okay. And if that, if for some reason that doesn't work, um, you can just like manually download as we do, and then we can troubleshoot yes, what's going on with getting GitHub afterwards, just so we can keep moving. And also you can follow along. Yes, sir. Sounds great. All right. Okay. Um, I'm assuming everyone else was able to pull it and have it open on the proper project. So I'm going to move on. If you need more time, let me know. So the this code here, our goal is to, I guess, run again that entire workflow that we have already ran. However, this time, treating blocks as random. So first seeing how we would do that, what's the difference in the code for you to do, at, to do that? And also, um, compare that to the results of the fixed block model that we ran on the previous script. I believe I left you most of the code here because again, we have already developed this code for the fixed effect uh, model and there is really not too many differences. Perhaps one of them that I, I left you already, but one of them is the library LME4. If you do not, Let's see, I don't remember now if we installed this before. So if you try to run this library LME4 and it says you don't have it, you're just going to need to install it using install.packages. You can go ahead and do that. I don't think it would take a lot of time. But I, I believe everything else we have already um, installed previously. So if you run that chunk, it should go through all right. You know, I do want to emphasize this again, and I will emphasize this continuously for every exercise we run on the same data set. For teaching purposes, we are analyzing the same data set with different models and different experimental designs, just so we can see how the same design evolves within a different model. However, for your own research, you will have this model defined even before you collect data, even before you set up your study, you should have your design your design defined which means your model is also defined so for your case you should not you cannot play around with different experimental design models right your model is defined in the moment that you should design your study and you should use that one only we're just playing around with different models on the same data just to make it easier for teaching purposes but we should not do that on our actual research data All right, so we're starting here by just importing that same data set. So that wheat and K bulk. Um, again, just a reminder, this, this has 36 rows, which in this case, each row is an observation of yield at the plot level, at the experimental unit level, meaning that we have 36 observational uh, units that are... Okay, nice, 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 uh, Austin. So you're able to follow, that's great. So we have 36 independent observations from this study where we have three nitrogen rates, three potassium rates and four replicates. It's always, I always recommend it to do some EDA, some exploratory data analysis. In this case, we're just doing using a, a summary function to get an idea. Everything else here we'll, we have already seen, but every time we do analysis for any new data set, you should check these. And also using glimpse just to explore some of the initial values of each one of the columns, but also how R is interpreting um, these columns here. So again, the column treatment is interpreting as numerical, but we really don't use that in our model. Rep is our block, is interpreting as numerical. We should 
treat this as categorical or factor. So we're going to have to fix that. The same thing for N rate and potassium rates. They should be factors because uh, that's we normally need factors to run an analysis of variance. And these are our treatment design uh, factors. So they should all be treated as categorical. So I left you the code for the wrangling there. We're just using a mutate to transform rep and, rep and rate potassium rate into factor. And then we're creating this column called treat TRT name that just combines N rates a plus and the potassium rates for plotting purposes at the end. Make sure you do run this chunk here. Don't forget to run it. I do a summary again, just to quickly take, you know, make sure that, that now our, our reps, our N rates and potassium rates are being treated as factor. And I know that because it's giving me their levels here and how many observations there is within each one of the levels. We had, I left you the EDA plots. Again, we already looked at these. I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. So it does not seem like we have much of a nitrogen rate effect in here. When we look at the potassium rate by itself, also does not seem like we have a lot of a strong effect of potassium rates. And then we use the facet grid to look at the, at the effect of nitrogen rates within a given potassium rate. So nitrogen rate in the x-axis, potassium rates as the different plots. And we see here that it seems like there is a different relationship of how nitrogen is impacting yield when you change your potassium rate. So perhaps there is a significant interaction here. And then now let's get to the model inside of it. So my, my text here is different from the previous um, script. The code is mostly the same, but the text I'm writing um, outside of the chunks is different. So just to remember, remind you, we want to run now an analysis where blocks are treated as random. The LM function that we've been using does not accommodate that. LM only allows for the estimation of a single source of variation, and that is the one coming from the air, which every model has, including only fixed effect models, like the ones we've been working until now. So LM, we're not going to be able to use that to run a mixed effect model if we want to treat blocks as random. So to overcome that, we're going to use the function LMER from the package LME4. This is not the only function in R that does this. There are other packages, other functions you can use. I just want to show you this because I think it's perhaps one of the most flexible uh, to use. We do want to make sure to run to change our contrast from set to zero to sum to zero. So make sure you run that options there. And then let's start coding here with our model. So the function we're going to use here is LMER, as we have already talked about. If you're not seeing that function, is because you have not loaded the LME4 package. Make sure that you load it. And if you didn't have it installed, that you installed it and then load it. I do just want to type here the data set. So the data set name is rcbd underscore dfw. That's the Wrangle version. I just want to print that below so we can copy and paste the column names. You can do that on your site as well. So our response variable is going to be yield, right? So that comes on the left side of the equation. We give it a tilde to then give the explanatory variables of this model. So what I want to do first is specify the fixed effect side of this model. How should I do that? What is the fixed effect side of this model? Okay, so I heard treatment. I heard N rating K rate, so that's right? So N rating K rate are the fixed effect terms of our model that we chose as our treatment factors. So those are normally fixed effects. We want to include, um, so I just copied N rates. I'm gonna use an asterisk and give K rates. So this is again, just to remind you in case you're not familiar with it, using the asterisk here is the same thing as saying N rate plus K rate plus N rate colon K rate. So asterisk breaks it down into all the main effects and all the interactions that may exist within or between these two factors here. So it's just a shorthand 
uh, or a short, short way, shorter way of specifying that. Okay, so our fixed effect is defined. Now let's define our random effect of this model. So let's add a plus. I want to break code just to make it easier. In LMER, the way that we specify a random effect is by using the following syntax. You open and close uh, parentheses, you give it a one, give it a vertical bar, and then you call the name of the column that you want to treat as random. So in our case, that column is called rep, and make sure your rep is being seen as a factor. Again, it has to be seen as a factor. That's the goal here. So what we're telling here is, you know, end rate, potassium rate, and their interaction are the fixed effect side of our models. And then wrap or block is treated as our random effect of this model. To finish this piece of the code here, we need to just add a comma and say, what is the data that this is coming from? So we say data equals to RCBD DF dot. All right, if we run this, if you got your parentheses correct, if you got your commas correct, um, you should have been able to run this. Now let's take a look at the summary of this model. There's gonna be a difference here, or maybe a few differences here. <clears throat> so it is telling us that it's a linear mixed model fit by Remmel. So it's using the restricted, restricted what is it? Yes. I was thinking about what the E meant. I forgot about it, but that's the part of the restricted. So restricted maximum likelihood uh, in our model here. That's what we want to use again, because this is going to help us to estimate those variance components on an unbiased way. So notice here that it gives you the formula. It gives you a convergence criteria that normally, I mean, you don't really have to worry much about it. It's just the way that it is searching the, 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 the space uh, when it's looking to, to optimize the values it gives you as variance components. So if, if there's a convergence uh, step related to that, it's given us our scale residuals, but then it has this, this new piece here that it didn't, we did not have with LM, which is called the random effects. So notice that the random effects include here really just the wrap and the residual, right? So the wrap here is that sigma square A that we saw in our example, Residuals is the sigma square E that we saw in our equation uh, in the in the lecture. So what we can see here is that we have the variance related to those and the standard deviation. So we see that the wrap here is explaining less variance than it is our residuals. So it was still useful to have blocks here, uh, but there's still a lot of noise that went into the residual. And this there, there's nothing to do with being fixed or random. It's just part of the data itself but it's just showing us that breakdown of variance between these two variance sources. Yes. Okay. I'm getting an error. It says error message. Error it is slowly being copied out of the object. Hmm. And you're using LMER? The same? Okay. So, <laughs> well, that's, isn't that awesome? <laughs> what, what was the solution? Matrix package. Okay, the matrix. Is still not working. If you reinstall the matrix package, I provided to fix that error. Okay, so Chris is saying if you if you install the the matrix package, so it's install the packages. I think it's uppercase M, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can try that installing that. And um, did you have to re to load the the matrix package or? Yeah, was that... I installed it and then I had to restart R, but it seemed to work. Okay. So yeah, so for those online as well, I on my side I did not get an error, but a lot of students here in Athens did get an error. That seems like the matrix package is needed, but it wasn't installed. Uh, so if you're getting that error as well, you can try to install the package first, and then remember to delete that. Um, and once you do that, if you 
if you go on your R Studio uh, under the session, you can restart R, which is just going to basically reset or restart your R Studio window. And then once once that happens, you come to this chunk that we were in, and you can just click this button to run all above. That should work in case you had you did not leave any lingering errors in your code. Do we need to uh, download the package if uh, we did even if we didn't have an error? Because I I was mine ran fine. Do we still need to? Yeah, if you did not get the error, then you don't need it. Uh, and yeah, this is something that probably I don't remember when I I mean when I first installed LME four, it was a while ago, so I don't remember if I got an error. But if you did not get an error, maybe you have already used LME LME four before, and that's the reason why. But so okay, so let me let me ask this: um, Who was not able to fix it? Pramod, were you able to? Okay. Online, was someone not able to fix it? All right, I don't hear anything, so I'm gonna keep going. Assuming that you were all able to, to get around this problem. Um, so let me just, I guess, let me go through again the summary, what the summary is telling us, uh, because maybe if you were worried about getting this fixed, maybe you did not hear what I said. So really the main part here that's different is that now when we look at the summary of this model, we have this random effects part of the summary that we did not have when we ran an LM object or an LM model. Here is just telling us how much variance is being explained by rep, which is what we set as our random effect, and then how much was still left at the residual. So remember, residual, every model has it. In this case here, rep was treated as random, so we have a variance component associated with rep. And then it gives our fixed effects side of the of the model, which at least in, in structure is very similar to the LM one. Um, the only difference here is if you were to compare this fixed effects of the LMER function, treating blocks as random with the fixed effects of when we treated blocks as fixed, you would have the block appearing on the fixed effects heart side of the model or the summary as well. In this case here, block is not here. Again, because we're not treating as fixed, we're not getting means for the blocks. So I just made a quick calculation here of how much of that variance was coming from, or was being, I guess, sucked by the model and how much was still left at the air. And you could just do a math of dividing that variance at the model by the sum of the variance of the model in the air, we get that about 14% of the total noise is coming or is being sucked into the model uh, in this case, or sucked into the block random effect. Okay, so if we come to the next chunk, I left you the code as well. It's just, uh, let's see, I think I actually have a typo perhaps on the object name, RCBD mix mod. Yeah, I had a typo. So make sure you fix that. It's RCBD mix mod and not mod mix. But when you run that, you're going to get this table here. So something to notice here as well is when we call the ANOVA table on a mix effect model, there is no line here for random effects, right? So rep is not here. And rep was here when we did LM, when we treated block as fixed. So ANOVA is going to give you the analysis of variance breakdown of your fixed effect uh, side of the model only. Uh, so we see that difference here. Um, so here is saying, and also you know, a very, very small difference here is if you were to look back at this function when you ran blocks as fixed, it would call, it would say analysis of variance. Here is saying analysis of deviance. But that's just because it's it's what is referring to when it's using restricted maximum likelihood to estimate uh, your variance components. So it's just a different way of referring to it, but it, it's still the same interpretation um, at the end. Okay, so as before, we we had so if you were, which you you will do at the end of this at the end of this script here. But if you have side by side the ANOVA tables from when you treat a block as fixed and block as random, you will notice that your 
so the chi-square values would, here is using a chi-square distribution in the fixed effect case was using uh, an F or T distribution. So that those values may change a little, but your p-values, which is really what we what would be more comparable, uh, are gonna also be different, right? Perhaps your interpretation may not change. Perhaps it could, depending on the data itself. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this at the end again. When do we choose blocks as random or as fixed? But in this case here, your p-values did change, um, but I guess our interpretation has not, which means our interaction is still significant. Our main effects are still not significant, like on the fixed effect side or the fixed effect block model. Because again, only our interaction was significant, we're gonna extract means for the interaction only. But before we do that, let's check our model assumptions. Uh, just a reminder, so the function augment that we used previously comes from the package broom and augment is the function that creates the residuals for you and gives you in the same data set that you used for the model. Because this is a mixed model, augment by itself, or the augment function coming from the broom package itself does not work with mixed effect models. However, there is a package called broom mixed that addresses that. So I don't think you have this package. You can go ahead and install it uh, as you've done for other packages. And once you do that, you should be able to just load. So remember to load it by running the library function after you install it. And then this function below should work for you. So the augment function should, um, should work. So if we, um, I'm gonna keep moving. If you have issues, let me know and I, I can stop. But if I don't hear anything, I'll keep moving. So once you install that and you load the broom, the broom, pack, broom mix package and you can run this augment function from that package, it will give you the residuals. And we're still, I still left to the code to calculate the studentized residuals like we did for the, for the uh, fixed effect model. And one difference here <clears throat> is when we, when we use the augment function on the fixed effect model that we were doing previously, it did give us a standardized, um, it gives a, like, a, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a standardized residual column. In this case, and then we, we on top of it, we did calculate our own studentized residuals as well. In this case here of a mis mixed effect model, it does not give you the augments does not give you that student that normalized residual by default. And that's why we were calculating the student ties for both cases because so augment does give you a normalized residual for LM. It does not give you for LMER. And because of that, I, I wanted us to calculate our own student ties residuals in both cases. So just to point that out. Okay, so we have our residuals, let's plot them, right? So we need to check for independence, so we don't wanna see any patterns in the residuals. We need to check for variance homogeneity, for residual normality, and also outlier detection, right? These are the, the things that we wanna check here. One of the differences here is, if you remember from the slides, Every time you have a new random component in your model that is estimating a variance component for you, the same assumptions that we were checking for the residuals are also applied to the random effect. So we also have to check some of those assumptions in this case here. I wanna show you how we would ex ex extract, because those, those residuals coming from the random, random effects are not part of the augment. So I wanna show you how we would first extract that. Uh, so we can check them. So if you come here on the code, you can give it an assignment symbol. There is the LMER or LME4 package has a function called run EF for random effects, where we just give it the model. So the model name that we that we uh, ran above is called RCBD underscore mix underscore mod. If you run that and you print it, you're gonna see there's gonna be, it's not a data frame itself, but it's just giving you um, the, 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 the estimate residual of that variance component for each one of the reps. 
because it gives us this dollar sign wrap here, I just, um, it means that we can sample this component here. Let's see if I just do dollar sign wrap, if that's gonna work. Yeah, that works. I had a different, a slightly different way of doing this in my code, but this, this works just fine. So if you just do dollar sign wrap, you do get that as a data frame and that's what we want. So again, because we only had four blocks, these are our estimates of those random effects for each one of the blocks. And again, you know, only four blocks, right? So we have this trade-off here of not having enough data to really assess the variance from the population of blocks. Maybe we should have eight, 10, 12 blocks here to really, you know, say that we're confident in this estimation. But anyways, we're going to proceed here. I left you the code for a QQ plot. So it's basically bringing in this object that we created above. So the run, run, rent F rep. And I'm just adding a QQ line for that. So I, I think you have all the code. You don't have to add anything to it. And again, we just have four points. It's kind of difficult to really assess normality when you have four points. So unless these were completely off, you know, I would I would perhaps worry. In this case, even though, you know, the tails are a little bit off, but with only four points, there's not a lot you can do really to say this is right or wrong. So it's just a way for you to check and see if there is something very wrong with this plot. Sometimes, uh, a word of caution here, when you run this, if you do run your blocks in your studies with block as random, if your block effect had very little effect, so it's actually um, the variance, the variance being estimated for the block effect is very small. So your block basically had very little effect. It may not be able to estimate your variance components, which in which case it sets them to zero. If that happens, that's okay. You don't have to worry much about it, but I just want to caution you that because if that happens, then this plot here is going to be a flat line because you don't have a distribution. Everything is zero. So if you, if you look at this plot and it looks like weird, like it's just a flat line going across, it's probably because the model was not able to estimate various components for your block in this case, because there was very little variability, variability related to them. In this case, it was able to estimate and we can check at least this plot here to check some of the assumptions uh, for the blocks. So really nothing too worrisome here, especially because we only have four data points. It's kind of difficult to, to really um, check much when it comes to that. And this is really perhaps the only plot that we make with when, when we're checking here because um, it is the one that is going to give us that information on the normality of the residuals. But then again, we only have four points. So if we do any of the other plots, it's also going to be, we're not going to learn much from the others. So I normally look at this when I'm checking the assumptions related to random effects. All right, so now we... So if you think about it, we had the, the various component related to the blocks and the variance component related to the residuals. We checked to some extent the assumptions of the random component related to the block. Now we have to check the residuals one, which is the same one that we've been using before. All right, so I left you the code here. Um, and as you, if you remember, this is the only plot that we, well, this and another plot. So this plot here, we can check three things, right? So we can check for independence, we talked a little bit about this already that it seems like we kind of have a flowing pattern, but I'm not too worried because the, the error bars around that smooth line all comprise zero. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, so I would say it is independent. We can also check here for variance homogeneity or lack of it. It does not seem like that's the case because we don't have this increasing uh, shape in the in these residuals. So I would say that looks good as well. And we can also check for residuals, right? So we're using this to the, the studentized residuals, which normalize our residual values. And then we can use the minus three and three thresholds. Nothing is outside of that, of those intervals. So I would say we're good there. And then to check for normality, we can make a few other plots. So again, QQ plot is one of them. We see here there's a little bit of a difference. And just to remind you, so raw data remains the same. Every time you change a model on the raw data, you will get different residuals, right? Residuals depend on data and model. So if you were to compare this, these residuals 
and residual plots with the ones when we ran blocks as fixed, they are going to be different, right? Because we're changing the model, even though it's just a change between if it's treated fixed or random, but we're still making a change. And then lastly, it's just that uh, the density plots for us to check the normality distribution of, or, or the distribution of the, of the residuals again, we see that they are almost sitting around zero and you know they don't really have anything going beyond minus three and three. So they look, they look pretty normal to me. So nothing to worry here, we can just keep going. Um, I'd left you the code again, but just to remind you, so we are extracting the, the means from the interaction because only the interaction was significant. Even if the main effects would have been significant, which they were not, we would still look and make inference on the interaction means in pairwise comparisons because that was the most complex uh, term in the model that was significant. So if you just run it, you're gonna get, um, you know, the same output that we've been getting before. Something that I don't think it was here before because it was not needed. As we start having mixed effect models, especially it's not, there's nothing to do really with the mixed effect itself. It's just as we start having more random effects in our models, and in this case, more random effects with fixed effects, it starts becoming more difficult to estimate the degrees of freedom of the of the denominator. I don't think we well, I mean, we talked a little bit about this on the ANOVA. So if you remember, what I what I mean when I say degrees of freedom of the denominator is for each ANOVA uh source of variation that we have, we can even go back to this. We don't have to go back on your side, but I want to go so you can see. So this DF column here is showing you the, the degrees of freedom of that term. So these would be the numerator degrees of freedom, right? When we talk about uh, mean squares. If you remember mean squares, um, it's gonna be, you're gonna divide the sum of the squares of that term by the degrees of freedom of that term, right? So these degrees of freedom here is what I'm talking about when you calculate the F ratio. So the F ratio, well, you know, I think I'm gonna, in this and talk to you about this again when we look at the ANOVA table, because that's going to be more helpful for you to follow through. But what I'm trying to say is that this, all these ANOVA tables show you the degrees of freedom of the numerator, which is the degree of freedom of that term. When we talk about degrees of freedom of the denominator, is basically whatever is the degrees of freedom of the error that's being used to divide this by and get you an FL. And in that case, let me just come back to where we were. So the degrees of freedom of the, of the denominator are related to your error. Because mixed effect models have different sources of error, so one coming from the residual, one coming from the random effects, it becomes a little bit more computationally intensive or tricky to approximate these degrees of freedom. And that's why here you're seeing degrees of freedom that are a fraction. And that's a difference. And it's telling you here in the bottom, what was the method used to estimate those degrees of freedom? So Canwell Roger is one of the methods. There's one called Satter, Satter Weights as well. Uh, and there's a few others, but these are the most common ones. I just wanted to make you aware because this was not needed when we only had one random source of error that was the, the residual error on a fixed effect model. Now on a mixed effect model, we have multiple sources of error, which means we have different terms that are being that are being pulled to bring the variability of the error that we're testing the fixed effects. Because of that, it's a little more trickier to estimate the degrees of freedom. In this case here, it is using the Kinwar Roger method to do that approximation. All right. Um, so if we just go to the next chunk here, we're just doing that, um, get, getting the pairwise comparisons where I'm using no adjustment and I'm ask, asking for letters. So it's just going to give me those letters, um, uh, as well. And lastly, um, you know, we're just 
doing a little bit of a wrangling of those letters so we can actually plot them. So this is, I'm just, I'm skimming through these because we have already developed these codes for the previous exercise and they did not change for this exercise. So we have already typed in all this on the previous exercise. So I'm just going a little bit faster uh, over them. So we're just creating that, transforming to a data frame, removing the white space for the letters, creating that treatment name column. And then we're just making this publication ready plot as well, um, where, I mean, you can, we're including the raw data using box plots and the letters as well coming from the statistical model. I left you all the code because again, we have done this on the previous exercise. So this is what it looks like. And then we are exporting this with the name RCBD underscore mix underscore means. The previous one that you exported from the RCBD fixed blocks was named differently, was I think RCBD means only. So we are exporting with a different name. So I have uh, an assignment that I actually, I did not fully write like as an assignment itself, but I do, I, I guess it's, it's something um, that I want you to do here in class. So 1036, I want to I want to just add those questions here and I want you to work in pairs so in in, in, two, in two teams of two students I think we have enough people that everyone can pair up with another person you may have to move a little bit but so what I want to want to ask you is the following so I want you to compare compare between the fixed effects block model Jesus. and the random effect block model the following so i want you to look at the anova table p values I want you to look at the EM means standard error values and I want you to compare the letters as well. So the letter separation. So what I want to propose is when you pair up with someone and we're going to do that in class, it's not going to take a lot of time, maybe, I don't know, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, but I want you that for one of you, I want you to start your or restart your R session and run the whole script for when we treated blocks as fixed. So one person does the fixed one, the other person restarts the R studio so you clean your environment and run all the code for the blocks as random. Okay, so one person does fix, one person does random, and I want you to compare these these things here. So look at each other's screens. Uh, I wanted to tell me what happened with the ANOVA table p-values, what happened with the E and means standard errors. So what I mean by that is if you go to the E and means chunk, I want you to look at this column here, the standard error column on the E and means chunk. And I want you to compare the pairwise comparison letters at the end. I wanted to tell me if they changed and if, so, I mean, they may or may not change. And if they did change in which way, like which one of the models had higher, lower and so on. So that's what I want to do, want you to do. If you want, um, let's see, how can we do this? Maybe you can email me, one of you can email me your answers. So lmbasters.uga.edu, um, include these, these three points here what you're seeing and then also uh, make sure to tell me the name of your partner because only one of you needs to send me the, the, the email. So go ahead and do that. Uh, if you are online and you cannot pair up, I guess you're going to have to look at both of those things side by side on your computer. You can still do it. There's, you know, there's no problem, but um, yeah, I guess you can go ahead and do it. I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes and make sure you submit that to me. It could be a word file, it could be in the email directly, it's up to you.
Hey, Dr. Bastos. Hey, Dr. Bastos. Yes. Can you pull up that sc the screen from R you had so I can see uh, exam again what you wanted? Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you. Let me actually, let me leave that up as well. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just do... Before you can. Oh, let me just make sure I leave the questions and the timer as well.
Dr. Bachelors, can you scroll back up? Yep, thank you. mute myself. I guess people online didn't hear this, but please send this in the next 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so you see how the time is, is going, it's going here. Yeah, we need to move on. And I do want to, you know, we're going to start talking about the answers here. So I don't want to disfavor anyone um, that has already submitted their, ans their answers. All right. <clears throat> so what did you find here? What maybe if, if someone from a group can share your thoughts of what were your answers? Okay. Well, let me just stop right there. So you said the p-value overall was higher for the fixed effect model? For the interaction. interaction. For the interaction. Okay, so the interaction p-value was higher, so meaning less significant for the fixed effect. Is that what you're saying? Does anyone agree, disagree? Is that what the conclusion you found as well? In both the cases, uh, only the interaction was significant. Right, so only in our significant. So the p-values did change on the ANOVA, right? And this is something that in our specific case here, that change did not change our interpretation. 
But depending on how much variability you have in the data, depending how much of that is being attributed to the actual block effect, it could change your interpretation. So just I just wanted you to realize that you know it is not it doesn't mean that it's always going to be higher for one or the other. It just means that it can be different. And as you know, we base our we base our interpretation and what, how we how we use these models for inference starting at that ANOVA p-value, right? So if that is changing, then that is changing how you're extracting means, your price comparisons, and so on. So, okay, ANOVA p-values were changing. Can someone else in a different group tell me about the E means standard errors? Mm -hmm. Different how? Okay, that, that, that's great. Thanks, 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 Benita. So Benita was saying here that the E and means themselves were the same, but the standard errors were different, where they were higher on the mix effect case. Did anyone find a different interpretation of this? I hope not, because that's the correct interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so let's just take a moment here and talk about this. What is going on here is that, you know, at least when I first came across this concept, I was like, well, if the standard error is higher for the mixed, I don't want that. I want my standard error to be smaller, so I should use fixed. And I think that's not the correct interpretation of this. The correct interpretation is that we want to have a standard error that is representative of that population. So if that true population standard error is higher, we want it to be higher because if we have it lower, then we are underestimating that and our results. And that is one small piece of the components of why sometimes research is not reproducible because we're not running a model that completely, well, completely perhaps is, is, is too ideological, but we're not running a model that at least approximates the error structure of the true world data that we're trying to estimate with our sample. So by having, on, on this case here, what is happening is that the EME center error is being calculated by this. On the fixed effect side is the square root of the sigma square error, so the residual divided by the R, which is the number of reps. In the case of the blocks, it is the sum of the sigma square from the error and sigma square from the block divided by, by the number of reps. So this is perhaps one of the main differences here between training as fixed and random if your block, if your study is balanced. So I just want to put that pin there. If your study is balanced, meaning that you have all treatments appearing in all blocks, maybe you have one or another missing data, but not a lot of missing data, then your it is most likely that your center error of the means from the mix effect model where block was random is going to be higher. It does not mean that's bad. It means that perhaps it is more closely approximating what happens in the true environment that you collect the data. So having a higher error is actually, you know, it's, it's I guess it's bad in the sense that, uh, that it's gonna make it a little bit more difficult to find differences. But if you run the wrong analysis and you get a way too low error, you may find differences, but maybe everyone around you doing the same study will not. So we want our, our, our you know, errors to be small, but to represent what's actually going on on, on nature, so we don't want to falsely have a low center error just so we can find uh, differences. Okay, uh, can someone else perhaps online tell me what you found on the letter separation comparison? I thought they looked uh, almost identical. Um, I was I was running out of time, so that was the point where I didn't have much time to write a good answer, but I, I thought they, I didn't really see much of a difference. Okay, so Austin is saying that it seems like the letters were the same. Uh, does anyone disagree with that? Do you think letters were different? Awesome, thanks Austin. Yes, so the letters were the same. And here is maybe another place where it's important to understand the difference between treating blocks as fixed or random. The only difference, and you're going to see this in the paper that you read on when I upload the link, when you have a balanced study, 
So you do all of your treatments appear at least once in a, in a block and you don't have too many missing data or missing plots. Everything else is going to be the same except the error of the means. When we do pairwise comparisons, that increased error of the mean is going to cancel out because you're comparing two means and then it's going to make your pairwise comparisons be the same as if you were treating block as fixed. So the only thing that changes between treating blocks as fixed or random when you have a balanced study is the E and mean standard, standard error. That's the only thing. Well, p-values as, as well could change as we talked about, but it's not going to have an effect on a letter separation. So this is perhaps one of the main differences. Again, if there's a big if here, if your study was balanced and you don't have missing data. However, this is not my case. I don't do plant breeding and genetics, but if that is your case, in plant breeding and genetics, there are different designs where you may not have all treatments appearing in all blocks, right? You may there's many different designs that that do that type of, of randomization where you don't have all treatments in all blocks. In that case, you do have a difference here between treating fixed and random. I'm not going to talk a lot about this in here, but I just want to point that out. If that is your case, when you go through the paper that I'm sharing, you're going to get you're going to understand better what happens when you do not have a balanced RCBD. Uh, with where all treatments are appearing in all blocks. So in, in this case, which I think is most people would have a complete randomized, complete block, block design. So you have all treatments appearing at least once uh, and you hopefully don't have too many missing data, then really there's not much of a difference in that case. Just to make that big if there, in that case. If you have, if you don't have an RCBD or you know have a more complex design that does not have all treatments in all blocks, then it does make a difference. If that's your case, you know we're going to learn more about that in the paper that I shared. And if you want more resources, I can give you. Just uh, let me know. All right. So this wraps up our block as random exercise. We have today. We're going to eleven thirty, right? So I do want to start the lecture on split plots. I think we should be able to finish it. Uh, just to introduce the topic, make sure that you understand the differences. And then next class, we're going to run the actual randomization of the split plot, which I do ask you to be thoughtful of how we randomize the, how we did with randomization for the randomized complete block design. That logic is, logic is going to come in handy when we do the split plots. And I will be asking you, it's not going to be an assignment, it's not going to be a quiz, but I will be asking you for your help in developing that logic. Um, and, and then we, after doing the randomization, we're going to go through the actual analysis of a split plot design as well. There are some differences there, some key differences there that are really important. If your design is a split plot in the field, you really have to be careful with your model because otherwise you will, it's easy to get the wrong model for, for that design. Uh, yeah. So uh, from that, uh, from those methods uh, that we have on the box plot, EM means, uh, what I was reading about EM means is that it also uh, uh, gives you the least square means, like it, it is all the other name for that is least square means. So can you also say that that is a, predicted deed that it shows. So th that is correct in the sense, so it is a predicted mean because it does not, so if you think about it, if, it, if you go back and look at the model, right, the effects model that we were looking at. So let me, let me actually pull that up here so we can have a conversation around that. <clears throat> I mean, I guess it could be this one here. So in this case here, we just have an overall mean, the effect of block, the effect of treatment, and then error. So it's a, a simplified example, right? So whenever you ask for a mean of a treatment, what is happening behind the scenes is that the model that you've created is combining the needed coefficients to give you that mean. And this is the main difference between a least squares means, which in this case here, we're using a, the expected marginal means would be the term for this, which is, is a synonym for that. So the least square means is just combining different coefficients that it estimated based on your data in a way that can give you that mean. 
right? So we would be combining the overall mean in a treatment effect. All the noise that was left that in this case was not explained by overall mean, not explained by, in this case here, the rho j is the block effect. So something that was not explained by mean block treatment ends up in the error. So that error then is our residuals, is that's what we check the assumptions based on. When you do ask for a mean from the model, it is using this model to give you a predicted mean, right? So it's predicting because it's using the coefficients that were trained based on your data to give you that mean. If you have balanced data, your least squares mean is gonna be the same as if you just do a group by summarize and get a mean. So the arithmetic mean and the least squares mean are the same if the data is balanced. If the data is unbalanced, it's different. Because in the case of an arithmetic mean, it's just, let's say, instead of having four reps, you have three. So you're going to do like number one plus two plus three divided by three, right? The arithmetic mean. The least squares mean does not do that. It does the formula still. So it's going to use, it's going to pull information that it learned from the other treatments as well into this. Because that coefficient for that treatment was estimated in the context of the data in the model. So the least squares mean is going to be different from arithmetic mean if you have unbalanced data. But yeah, I guess I, you know, I don't, I don't, I guess I never thought about it as far as like thinking of it as a predicted mean, but it really is. It is a predicted mean. Yeah, based on that model. Yeah. And uh, I have another confusion like uh, uh, for those uh, uh, like when we see the model assumptions. And if there is any problem with the data, like how to fix that? Like, uh, because in real life data, we have a lot of variations. In. Yeah, that could be the whole course. <laughs> <laughs> like how to fix your assumptions when they don't, don't match. Um, yeah, so it depends on the assumption that is, that is being violated. Um, there are different ways of, I guess, making sure that the model and the data have a better fit and that you check your assumptions. Um, yeah, it's it's something that is is more complex than we can talk about it. And he really, if so, we're going to talk about re repeated measures after we split plot. Repeated measures is one way of fixing a violation of the independence assumption, right? So we're going to talk about one way of fixing one of those violations. We're not going to talk about all of them, but if you do have if you do run into issues where in your data you have certain violations of the assumptions and you don't know how to handle, let me know. I have some resources I can share with you, you know, some books, some ebooks, some like blog posts of different people that show this analysis. So uh, uh, I took one of the courses from Dr. Jason Wallace and um, uh, that was genomic section course. So in that course, he just taught us that uh, uh, you just, uh, when you look for the normalization of data and if there is some outlier, so you just make a histogram of it and you just uh, minus it, like we'll give, give a vote so that it won't read that value that is an outlier. So mm -hmm. is this how we fix that or is, is this a different case? So that would be one way of approaching outlier, right? So if you have an outlier in your model, exclusion of that data point may help it. I, I mean, I, so it's a different discipline. So maybe the the approach is different. The way that I've been trained and the way that I proceed is I do not just simply delete all liars because they're all liars. Uh, I only delete them if I have a good reason for that. Like, okay, I know it was like a data entry error or something like that. If I don't have a good reason for deleting an outlier, um, I I try to go some other route of, of at least accounting for it in a way that makes sense. Yeah. I have another question that soon has to um, Let's say that you run your linear model and you saw that all the model assumptions were accomplished, mm -hmm. but you go back to your raw data, you have, I don't know, a skew data by model distribution. So you can completely ignore that, uh, like that raw data distribution um, and go ahead with the linear model you did? Or... So, okay. Uh, so just to repeat that for the for online. So Jonathan was asking if your raw data is not normal, but your residuals look okay, mm -hmm. is it okay to use the model? Yes, because so the a lot of times you know if you look at the raw data distribution, 
it's it may not be normal or it may have i don't know some other violation even though violations i don't even though people do this but i it's not correct to check assumptions on the data right because again data is going to be static the residuals will change depending on the model so we want to check residual assumptions that's what it should be based on so sometimes that may happen may, sometimes maybe your data your raw data is doesn't look very normal but when you fit a model that is accounting for the lack of normality in the raw data making the residuals normal then you're good Sometimes I think what is perhaps most common is your raw data is not normal. You run that in your model, the residuals are not normal. So when there's an issue there on the residuals and you go back and you see, oh, the data started this way, my model is not addressing it. So it's more of a change of the modeling side of things and not in the past, I, th I think it was, I mean, it's still being taught, but um, I think it was more common for people to recommend transformations of data. So doing like log or square root uh, or, or some other transformation, I think that was more common. And it was mostly because we were trying to make the data fit the model because that was easier computationally to do than make the model fit the data. I think these days, um, it's, even though transformations of data are still taught, still used, still published, but we have other tools that actually allows us to use more complex models, if you have enough data for those complex models, to actually change the model and make that fit the data better than changing the data to fit a linear model. Um, but so, you know, one example is, so linear models were, are still used for us so many different types of response variables, but really they were created to be used with response variables that are continuous and that are not bounded, right? So even if you think about yield, yield is bounded by zero. It doesn't have, I mean, perhaps it has an upper biological boundary, but the, on the lower side, it cannot get a negative yield, right? So even there, maybe, I mean, the most part linear model does fine there, but if you're playing with yield value that are really close to zero, you may have issues fitting a good model because it's gonna try to go negative, even though biologically it doesn't make sense. But things like counts or percentages or other data that we know from the data generating process in the nature is not normal. Um, people will still fit normal or linear models to those data and they may still get good residuals, but perhaps it would be best to use a different model altogether that takes into account that initial data generating process distribution that is not normal. So it could be binomial or a multinomial or, or something like that. But I mean, if your data is, is at least continuous, but doesn't look normal, but you run a model and your residuals are normal, I would not worry about it. Great questions. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the most, that's the one that the model is the least robust against, yeah. Like you still have to fix that. Yeah. So in that case, if you just have an issue of variance homot or heterogeneity, you could so the assumption the model makes all these assumptions because it's basically it has those assumptions represented on the matrices behind the scenes that is running a model. So one of the assumptions, for example, is that your variance is the same. So it is estimating a fixed variance for all the treatments or all the data points. If you come back and you see that maybe you have, you know, I don't know, let's say you have 10 varieties and maybe there's a group of varieties that have very, very little variance. And there's another group that has very large variance. You could create another column in your data that you say one, one, or A, 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 B, 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 for different varieties that have different variances and then fit, allow the model to be more flexible and actually estimate two variance components, one for each type of group of variety group. And then if you do that on the same data, you just allow the model to be more flexible and then you check your residuals, then they should not look like they have heterostaticity. So that would be the fix for, for lack of homogeneity is like, trying to, to see if you can find patterns in your data as far as these treatments or these blocks or these whatever are in your model have seen visually seem like they have different distribution of variants. So we'll group them 
and allow tell the model to estimate a separate various component for them instead of assuming that they share the common various component. Awesome. Um, any other questions or thoughts? All right, so let's at least get started with our uh, split plot lecture. <clears throat> And I just want to tell great questions. I really um, like that you're asking questions. I think it's a it's time well spent when we're discussing these things. So feel free to. to best, please. Yes. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't know if you remember this, but back in like when I was getting ready, when you were helping me get ready with my poster, when you were talking about the outliers, then we had that same situation occur with me where I had outliers that I was going to remove, and and that and that one happened. I can, if I remember correctly. Where, so. Uh, I remember having that conversation uh, when we were looking at your at your residuals. Yes, sir. And I think I recommended you not to simply remove them, but to go back and check. Um, yes, and I think you said the same thing though. Was, I know uh, just just because you know, I had, we didn't know the reason why they were outliers, and so we had to keep them in. Yeah, I think that was, and I, I I actually I don't know if we met after that, so I don't know how you handled it in the end. But... I, I left them. I left. Them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely, you know, if you don't have a good reason, I would try to just maybe tr fit a different model that can try to accommodate them. And sometimes, like, you know, maybe if we just have one more comment about that. So if you have outliers that you go back and you cannot find a good reason for them to be outliers, what I would do is, so I would not simply remove them and keep going. I would run my analysis with them, look at the interpretation, look at the results, and then I would do this, this exercise of then removing them, rerunning everything, and then comparing my interpretation, right? So if your interpretation does not change, and what I mean by that is, let's say your means, I mean, your means may change, but if your statistical difference between the comparisons of means or maybe the statistical difference of your model estimates, if that interpretation is not changing, then I will leave them in the model as is. If your interpret interpretation does change, I think then it requires a little bit more decision making as far as, okay, if I leave them in, I don't have a good reason to remove them, but if I do remove them, I change my interpretation. Then you kind of have to see in which way that is changing. And, you know, perhaps you can make a point to a reviewer that, okay, I removed them without reason because they were affecting my model in this way. And we know that this response in nature should be that way, which is what I get, you know. So there's some room, I guess, to remove if you don't have a good reason. But you do have to make a strong point for that. It's not just like, okay, it's on a liar, let's remove it, keep going. It's not like that. Also, because something, I don't know if you ever tried this, any of you in your own analysis. So you run a model, you find outliers. Let's say that you find a good reason to remove them. So you have three outliers and you remove them from the model. So I mean you remove them from the data and you refit the model. And now you have four new outliers. And then you remove them and you'll keep going. Because the thing is, outliers, again, depend on the data in the model. So you're keeping the model the same, but you're removing points from the data, which are going to give you different outliers on the second time that you run the data set that you remove the first data points. So there's nothing keeping you from just creating new outliers every time you remove something, because now the model is changing. So you're, you're, the data is changing. The model is feeding a new data and therefore giving the new residuals. So there's nothing keeping you from removing these first outliers we're running a model and getting new outliers now. So that could happen as well. And that's why we also don't just remove just because they're outliers. Yeah. Awesome. Great, great conversations. Great questions. Um, let me pull up here the split plot lecture. I don't think we're going to end today, but that's fine. Uh, we'll end on Tuesday and then do the exercises. So if you come here on the website, um, the, the slides are posted on today's class. <clears throat> All right, let's 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 get through this. Um, so what the goal of this presentation here is for us to explore some key concepts in split plots. So we're gonna be talking about different sizes of experimental units. If you have run a uh, split plot, you know what, it, what I'm talking about. Um, that will have implications on how you randomize your treatments. So it's gonna be different from as we were doing even with just the RCBD. We're gonna look at the effects model and how the ANOVA table 
combines all those changes. Just to remind you, our motivational example here was uh, this treatment design that we had a two-way factorial where we had three nitrogen rates, three potassium rates, and all possible combinations between these, these uh, factor or these levels for a total of nine treatment combinations. And up until now, I just want to make this clear. Up until now, we were doing all these nine treatment combinations without a hierarchy, right? So we had all of them, if you think about it, on this, like, I could have any of, the, of these nine treatment combinations falling next to each other within a block, or maybe within the study if it was a CRD. Now things are going to change a little. So when is the split plot needed? One example here is when the levels of one of the repair treatment factors need more or less experimental material, you can think about space perhaps. It needs more or less space than the levels of the other treatment factors. Let's put this into an example to visualize this. So let's say in our case, our potassium, uh, so we have potassium and nitrogen rates. So let's say that the way that we're applying potassium, we're using a 12 row spreader. So it's a spreader that it spreads that dry fertilizer on a swath of 12 rows. But then we apply nitrogen rates with another equipment that is, uh, we're, well, in this case here, I guess I use a different picture from the text. But this case here is a sprayer that we're just spraying the liquid fertilizer on top on four rows. So we're applying potassium on 12 rows, nitrogen in four rows. So we're using different amounts of space to apply both of those treatments. So if that is the case where your treatments are applied at different scales, and also you don't have enough experimental material to simply have all plots be 12 rows, right? So if you don't have that space here, so in, in, the, in this example that we just talked about, you know, we, we may decide to have our potassium treatments applied on those 12 rows. And if we do have the space, we may decide then to have our nitrogen treatments having three passes within each one of the one pass of potassium treatment. So we could decide to do that here uh, instead. If we did, so potassium requires a larger plot. If we have the space, we don't need a split plot. If we do not have the space, then we need to think of a solution for this. So in the example where you do have all plots having 12 rows to accommodate all combinations of potassium and nitrogen at the same hierarchy level, we will require 432 total rows because we have 36 plots and 12 rows per plot. So that, that those are how many rows we would need here. However, let's say that in our farm, uh, you know, in the place where we're going to have our study, we only asked for plots of size four rows. So we do not have enough area to create all plots being of size 12 rows. In the way that we only have a total of 36 plots times four rows, 144 rows total in this area that we can fit. So we don't have enough space here. And this would be just an example. So this is what we've been talking about in our studies up until now, where we have, at least originally, if you can think about each one of the plots being four rows. Now, I need plots of 12 row sizes. So I have um, nine plots here because I have nine treatments of 12 row sizes. You can see that it does not fit in our area. If this is the case, if these plots, if you don't have enough space to fit all the plots of the larger size, then we have to rethink of our design and, and be strategic about it. All right, so let's change a little bit our motivational uh, example here where we do have a two-way factorial in a split plot design. Where whenever we're talking about split plot is gonna have at least one split where the way that we refer to it is the whole plot treatment factor being the treatment factor applied to the larger footprint. In this case here would be potassium fertilizer that's being applied at 12 row size. And we, had up, and we also have our split plot treatment factor in this case, here are nitrogen rates that are being applied on four row plots only. So notice here that we have two different sizes of experimental unit, and this is key for split plots because that means you're gonna have two errors coming from different sizes of experimental units. And the way that we combine this in the analysis is gonna be super important 
to make sure that our errors are properly describing our what happened on the field. So in this case here, we still have all the nine treatment combinations, uh, but they're being assigned to different sizes of, of ex experimental units in this case. So a split plot, I think, you know, I actually, I don't really know if split plot is considered treatment design or, or experimental design, because I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and in that way, it can be used with any experimental design itself. So we could have a split plot in a CRD, we could have a split plot in our CBD or even other designs. I do wanna focus here with the assumption of heterogeneous experimental material, because that would be the most complex situation we have here. Uh, and assuming that we need an RCBD for this case. All right, so remember that on the randomized complete block design, we randomize treatments within the block, right? So each block received a different separate independent randomization from the other block. In this case here, we're gonna do that still, but the first thing that we will randomize is the whole plot treatment factor within the blocks. This is how that would look like. So within our study area, we, within each one of the blocks, each one of these different colored rectangles, they, what they're meaning here is a different potassium rate. So we have four, 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 12 rows, which is the swath we need to apply potassium. So we're applying a, a fixed potassium rate within each one of these larger uh, colored dash uh, whole plots here. So we do, we randomize first the whole plots for block one, for block two, block three, and block four independently, just like we did before with a, with a randomized complete block design the example we had before. So first we randomize the whole plot treatment within each one of the blocks. Next, we then randomize the split plot treatment factors within each one of the whole plot experimental units. So then we would come here and within each one of these blocks of potassium that receive a one rate of potassium, we come and randomize the three rates of nitrogen, right? Because again, nitrogen only needs four rows, potassium needs 12. So we have those two different footprints here in a way that we can still have all of our nitrogen, all of our combinations between three rates of potassium, three rates of nitrogen in the whole study where, you know, if we were to do all the plots of 12 row of 12 rows, we would not have space. In this case here, we are able to fit them in the, in the area of this study. I think this is a good stopping point uh, for today. So next class, we're gonna finish this lecture. We're gonna randomize a split plot study and we're gonna analyze the split plot study as well. You don't have to uh, submit your attendance that was going to be that's going to be considered through the assignment that you sent so you're good to go um and i'll see you on tuesday